hello, I'm Helen, and um, I'm going to give my talk today on some of the work that I've done uh, in my PhD and at my first postdoc in Edinburgh. So um, before I start my talk properly, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that the work that I'm going to present today it has had many contributions, uh, contributors. I'm going to be discussing uh, results from my PhD at Queen Mary and my first postdoc in Edinburgh. So here I've got a list which isn't as comprehensive as it could be of all the people that I've primarily worked with at each institution. So at Queen Mary, my supervisors, Anthony and Martin uh, at University of Edinburgh, that was my first postdoc, um, Simon Parsons, Ewan Brief and Stephen McGough, and uh, the Beamline scientists at Isis and Diamond, uh, mainly Helen and Matt and Mark Warren on I-19. Okay, so let's get on with the presentation. Uh, today my talk's going to be focused on two different projects that I worked on, both which use central facilities to derive the structure of materials. And there are a couple of things I want to say about central facilities. First is that they are a fantastic resource, and I've been very lucky that in my scientific career, I've had access to some really great facilities, uh, neutrons at ISIS and x-rays at Diamond, and the support and expertise of everyone who manages the beam lines and instruments as well. Second, that I want to say is that for the type of questions I'm asking, the central facilities aren't the last step or the final jigsaw piece. Uh, for me, at least, what they are is the basis on which I need to build my models, my uh, arguments, and design any additional experiments. And I would imagine, actually, that, this, uh, that the instance of people coming to beam time and getting a structure and that being the only thing they need is actually pretty rare. And today I'm going to talk about the additional experiments and calculations that I run after beam times and how important it is to pick the correct tool for the job. So what are the two questions that I want to answer here? I'm going to talk about two different projects. I've got two different questions. And the first is how do changes in the local structure of some MOFs cause them to display interesting and useful bulk properties? And the second question is how do changes in the average inter and intramolecular, inter and intramolecular geometries of molecular magnets affect their magnetic ordering temperature and the magnitude of the exchange interactions. This may seem a bit academic at the moment, and I'll go into the specifics of the types of materials that I'm interested in, but I just want to take a moment to discuss why this sort of research is carried out. Most investigations into functional material properties stem from a desire to improve on the current generation of materials. Uh, for example, if we have materials that have a coupling between an electronic and a magnetic moment, we, we want to understand the underpinning mechanisms, which can then lead to opportunities to increase the strength of the coupling, uh, increase the temperature at which uh, cooperative behavior is, uh, is seen. And uh, in order to do this, it's necessary to understand how they behave and respond to changes in thermodyna thermodynamic variables like temperature and pressure. And we need to understand what's happening on the atomic scale. Okay, so looking at the first question here, uh, what's the best tool to look at changes in the local structure of some offs? Now, there are, re there are many ways to probe the atomic structure, uh, such as traditional Bragg diffraction, M NMR, Raman spectroscopy, but none of these methods give us direct access to the local structure of a material. And to access the local structure, we have to perform total scattering experiments. These total scattering data, coupled with uh, computer modeling using the RMC algorithm, allow the local structure of materials to be modeled via atomistic configurations, which we can then directly analyze. Total scattering experiments I know have been mentioned in this series before, but the gist of it is that we measure the Bragg peaks, and this tells us the, what the average structure is like, and it assumes a repeating motif of perfect identical unit cells. And these Bragg peaks are big and bright and they dominate the scattering pattern. But they aren't the only thing that's here. Total scattering experiments also record information underneath the Bragg peaks. Uh, and it's this information that we use to model how our local structure derive, uh, deviates from the average. So uh, I'm just going to mention this book here. Um, I know it's been mentioned before, but underneath the Bragg peaks talks about local structure and uh, atomic modeling. This is Simon's book. Uh, have a look at it underneath the Bragg peaks. If I had to give you an example of local versus average structure, just on, on perhaps a scale that is more intuitive, uh, if you think about high school, the average age of students will be something like 14 years old. 
However, if I walk into any one classroom, I'm likely to be surrounded by students from only one year group. So while the average age is 14, I wouldn't expect every classroom to only contain 14 year olds. What I would expect is that classrooms would have clusters of students with similar ages, however. Okay. So if that's my question, what's the best tool? I want to perform total scattering experiments. How about I-15 or XPDF at Diamond? That's a total scattering instrument. But if the local structure I'm interested in contains a lot of hydrogen, then X-rays might not be the best tool for the job. So X-rays interact with the electron of an atom, which means that as far as X-rays are concerned, the more electrons you have, the bigger you appear. And when we're collecting and analyzing X-ray data, it's often difficult to see lighter atoms as the diffraction pattern is dominated by contributions from the heaviest atoms in the system. This is an example of a moth here. So I've got a pink metal uh, vertex and we have them linked in a framework by a formate chain. And inside, I've got uh, an organic molecule just in, inside the pore here. These kind of peachy colored um, atoms, these are all hydrogens. Now, if I'm interested in how these hydrogens uh, form short bonds or perhaps longer bonds with the frameworks, I can't really use x-rays to look at these because the hydrogens are going to be nearly invisible. Luckily, the same isn't true for neutrons. Okay. So this graph shows the neutron scattering length for several elements on the y-axis as a function of element number on the x-axis. Um, the scattering length is essentially a measure of how big the neutrons will see the atom in the sample as. Um, so for vanadium, atomic number 23, just here, the scattering length is nearly zero. Neutrons will barely see it and they'll just pass through without noticeably interacting with it. If you have a look at dysprosium, atomic number number 66, this has the largest scattering length, and neutrons will scatter from dysprosium elements very, uh, from dysprosium very readily. And what's important for my elements, at least, is the scattering length of deuterium, which is about six and a half femtometers here. So deuterium is just hydrogen with an extra neutron, and it appears to be quite large to the incoming neutron. So the neutrons will scatter really readily from it and will be able to accurately model the position of the deuterium in the system. So while x-rays are fantastically useful when we're interested in positions of heavier atoms, if we want to know where the lighter atoms are, we can look to something like neutrons instead. Okay. The best tool for the job then is a total neutron scattering experiment and that would be using something like GEM or Polaris at ISIS and they're on target station one and these experiments are fantastic they're great but they take a long time um, when we're interested in the local structure we're, we're trying to see these things underneath the Bragg peaks underneath these really strong reflections we have weak uh, long range order uh, short range order that we can see so we're looking for something very weak which means we need to collect for a very long time we're also using neutrons, which have a much lower flux than you would see uh, from x-rays, which means we also have to collect for a longer time, so we get decent counting statistics on our weaker features. Uh, so for these sorts of calculations, we're talking about uh, if we were doing a variable temperature run, each, each total scattering measurement would take about eight hours to collect. And we also have to take into account things like background contributions. At the size of these diffractometers here, um, you could probably have a human being standing up uh, alongside here and be dwarfed by the instrument. And I think one of these, you can actually walk inside and have a look. So you have a very big instrument, you have a lot of containment um, around it, and you need to subtract all of the backgrounds that, you, uh, that the neutrons see. Let's go back to the other question. Um, what about what happens with molecular magnets when you squeeze them? Here I'm interested in how the geometries change as we increase the external pressure on a molecular magnet. I'm not too interested in the local structure anymore or any potential changes in it. What I want to know is what happens to the average structure as I change the external pressure. This means I don't need to run uh, total scattering experiments at all. And I'm also not interested in hydrogen or deuterium in these. I'm interested in what the heavier atoms are doing. So that means I don't need to use neutrons and instead I can use much faster x-rays and in fact in theory I can run these experiments in my home institution lab. So why do I need 
central facilities to do these? Well, the answer is time. This is the setup of a diffractometer in a, a lab, so a local diffractometer that you will potentially have access to. Just talk you through uh, what we have here. We have got the collimator. This is about the size of a biro. And that's where the x-rays come from. We have a detector. We have a beam stop. And here we've got a crystal on a goniometer. So it's a single crystal on the end of the fiber. And the goniometer and a detector move relative to each other um, for us to get a full evolved sphere of information. Um, this sort of crystallography, it uses the repetitive nature of the unit cell to describe a fairly complicated structure using very few atoms and usually a lot of symmetry operations. The distances between the points on the diffraction pattern will tell you how big the unit cell is and the relative intensities will tell you where everything is inside of it. So if we, if we have a setup like this, where we've got a single crystal on the end of a fiber, we will be able to collect data from the full evolved sphere. But I want to know what's happening to these molecular magnets under pressure. So for that, I need additional equipment. Again, I know um, someone's mentioned high pressure crystallography already on these talks. So brief, brief overview here. We have to use a diamond anvil cell to generate the pressures that we're interested in. Now, these sorts of pressures are a few GPA. So this is elephant in high heel sort of levels rather than center of the earth levels of pressure. Um, the first thing is just let's look at how the pressure is actually applied. So we've got two diamonds here with flat faces and they indent a tungsten gasket. And inside that gasket, we drill a 300 micron hole and the sample and some pressure transmitting medium are all put inside of that hole. Uh, 300 microns is roughly the width of four human ha hairs on average. So this means we can't put a crystal that's any bigger than say 150 microns in diameter into uh, a diamond anvil cell or into this particular diamond anvil cell. We're also limited in how we can collect data based on the bulk of this actual, of the diamond anvil cell itself, of the whole setup. Uh, in order to um, collect our data on a fiber, we can rotate the crystal and the detector relative to each other. But now we have extra equipment that we have to take into account. So if we go back to our lab setup now, and instead of having a crystal on the fiber, we've got a diamond anvil cell on a goniometer. And hopefully you can see that in this current orientation, we're not going to be able to collect any data whatsoever. We can only collect data when the x-rays are going through the front or the back of the diamond itself. And we have the bulk of the diamond anvil cell is limiting how much data we can collect. If we have a little look at this image here, so for the uh, crystal on a fiber, we had this whole area was full of spots. But if we have a look at the one for the diamond anvil cell here, and this is just uh, an example frame, you'll notice that there's this kind of semicircle here where there's nothing after. And this is due to um, shading from the diamond anvil cell itself. So we have physical limitations on how much data we can collect. And we also have limitations in the size of crystals that we can look at. So this GIF here um, shows us the diffraction pattern for a single crystal on a stick and one from a DAC. And we can see how high pressure crystallography gives you a lot less to work with. So first off, in the background in, the, in blue, we have the full collection in reciprocal space for an ambient and a high pressure measurement. Now for the ambient me measurement, that's this one here, and we're looking at the back in blue we have a full evolved sphere of data. However, in the high pressure one, so that's this one here and the background again in blue, we're missing large chunks of data. We've kind of got like a donut shape of data instead. And this is due to shading from the DAC. There's nothing that we can do about this. If we have a look at the progression of our diffraction pattern, so these are these little uh, moving uh, videos here in red, there's a few differences between the ambient measurement and the high pressure measurement. The first one is that in the high pressure measurement, you're going to see these bright kind of uh, irregular shaped peaks pop out every uh, now and then. And these are diamond reflections. There's nothing we can do about them. They're intrinsic to the experiment. We just have to take them, but they can overload a detector. So we've got to be um, careful about how long we expose a sample for and correcting for them and not thinking that they are actual data in our, um, in our actual diffraction pattern. 
Uh, the second thing that you might notice is that in the high pressure range, we have these kind of uh, semicircular rings showing here. Now these are from the beam hitting the tungsten gasket, which we need to generate the pressure. In a lab-based setup, we're using a collimator that's as thick as a pen. The X-ray beam itself isn't that thick, but it is wider than we would see at something like diamond. Uh, and that means that sometimes if we haven't centered uh, a crystal perfectly, we're going to have contributions from the tungsten gasket itself. So, the last thing I want to say about um, the, lab uh, the lab base source is that it can take a long while to collect these data. We are limited to how bright our lab source is, and we are limited to uh, this particular source only had one wavelength. There's maybe you can get a dual wavelength source, but there's not a lot you can um, do about the counting statistics. If you have a weekly diffracting sample, you just have to collect for longer and longer and longer frames. The way we get around this is we go to somewhere like Diamond. Specifically, um, we can look at, uh, we can use I-19. So running a single high pressure diffraction job on our lab base source can take anywhere from around eight hours to two days, depending on what the sample is. Um, if you want to look at a pressure series, so more than one pressure point, the time that it takes for you to collect the data, increase the pressure, collect the data, increase the pressure, it becomes far too long far too long for fair use of a lab-based source. So at Diamond, and specifically on I-19, a high pressure collection takes 14 minutes. In fact, it takes almost the same amount of time to center the crystal and to clear the experimental hutch as it does to take the actual measurement. Um, and I know actually that the beamline scientists on I-19 have been uh, looking at speeding this up. So this is the setup of I-19. We have a detector like we would have in our lab. We have a goniometer, and you'll see that this is, a, so this is someone's hand here. So this just gives you a bit of a scale. I think this goniometer weighs about 70 kilos. It's, it's quite large. Um, so this is a goniometer. We have a crystal in a diamond anvil cell on here, and we have a collimator of a much finer beam coming through. So at I-19, you can select what wavelength you're interested in, you have a much, much brighter beam. And instead of a frame taking anywhere from five to 60 seconds, it takes about 0 0.04 of a second for a frame. This is why you can collect data much, much, much quicker than you could at a lab-based source. Okay, so what's the best tool to look at uh, high pressure molecular magnets? It's Diamond's I-19. Okay, so we've picked the tools for the job. Um, Let's have a look at a couple of examples. So for the local structure of the MOF, I want to use total neutron scattering experiments. And for the uh, high pressure molecular magnets, I want to use uh, I-19. I said I was gonna use other, um, other experiments as well though. So for the, uh, MOF, uh, for the MOF question, I'm gonna have to generate really large atomic models. I'm interested in the local structure, which means I need to make big atomic models. And for the high pressure calculations, once I know what the structure's doing, I actually need to know what the magnetic response is. So I'll generate small atomic models because I'm only interested in the average structure. I'll then do squid magnetometry under pressure. And actually we found out that there were some optical measurements that we could do also under pressure. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss these right now. So let's have a look at this MOF. Um, this graph here shows um, two pictures of the anisotropic dielectric permittivity of a MOF between 0K and room temperature, and the molar heat capacity of that MOF between 100 and 210K. Just by looking at these two graphs, we can see that something interesting is happening at around 158K, and something else interesting is happening at 187K. So we've got a peak in the permittivity and the heat capacity at, 180, at 158, and then we have some smaller feature here at 187. The regions here I've split into three phases. I'm, I'm proposing that these are three different phases, a low temperature phase, a high temperature phase, and an intermediate temperature phase. This is the MOF itself. This is what it looks like. We have got potassium and iron metals on the corners of a uh, cyanide-linked framework. And inside we've got a host uh, guest molecule 
that's an imidazole ring that is free to rotate around its plane there. Our plan was to collect total scattering data in all three phases and then to model the interactions between the hydrogens of this imidazole ring and the framework itself. We were expecting to see some sort of cooperative behaviour. So just before these peaks in the dielectric permittivity at 187 and 158 K, we were expecting to see some sort of ordering between the imidazoles in neighbouring rings. So this is what we did. We collected the data. That's the first step. And I said the Bragg peaks, these are the big things that uh, give you the average structure. And you still get those in a total scattering experiment. You can't not get them. And there's a lot of information that can be pulled from them. So if we just have a look here, you can see that I have got, uh, I've collected data in all three phases, three in the high and three in the low temperature phase, and two sets of data in the intermediate temperature phase. From the Bragg peaks alone, we can see that something's going on. As we get cooler, so as we go from red down to blue, we'll see that these peaks start moving towards the left, that's indicating a contraction in the unit cell. And in the intermediate temperature phase, so these three measure, uh, sorry, the low temperature phase, these three measurements here, we see the emergence of an additional peak, 112, at around four and a half um, despacing, which isn't in the high or the intermediate temperature phases. So we've got a lot of information already just from our average structure. From that same scattering data, we can also get the scattering function, the I of Q, and its real space Fourier transform, the pair distribution function. So the pair distribution function is just a histogram of interatomic separations. If we have a look at this, this first peak here, about 1.1 angstrom, tells us the distance between the deuterium and the carbon and the deuterium and the nitrogen in the imidazole ring. The next peak at 1.15, that's the distance between the cyanide linkers. 1.35 is the carbon and nitrogen in the imidazole rings and so on. As we go to higher um, distances, it becomes harder to accurately identify which uh, contributes to which. We take all of, these, uh, uh, all of this information and we give it to RMC. So this is a program that will optimize an initial configuration. To generate our initial configuration, we have to start from our average structure. This is the thing that we got from our reap belt refinement, the Bragg piece. Now, I said I was interested in an, the dynamics of an imidazole ring. That's a five-membered, two-nitrogen, three-carbon ring inside a framework. But the average structure, it's actually easier to model this disordered five-membered ring as a perfectly ordered six-membered ring. That's fine if you're just interested in the average structure, but what we're specifically wanting to look at are, uh, are how each individual ring interacts with the framework. And so the first thing we had to do we have to identify all these six-membered rings. We see we've got this kind of repeating motif that we would expect from uh, a perfect crystal, and we replace them with dynamic, uh, with disordered imidazole rings. So they're still planar, but now they're the correct, uh, the correct ring, and they're randomly oriented. We take this initial configuration and all of the information that we've got from our experiments, and we put it into RMC profile. So the RMC program takes an initial configuration and it works out what the Bragg profile would look like, what the pair distribution function would look like, what the scattering function would look like for that particular model. And then it randomly moves an atom by a random amount. If that move has improved the agreement between its calculated uh, profiles and the ones that we've given it, the ones that we've calculated, it will accept that move. If it doesn't, if it makes a worse fit, sometimes it will accept it just so we don't get stuck in the local minimum. We're using models that are around 10,000 atoms big, and for each temperature, we're generating around 50 models. So there's a lot of data that we can pull, and all of these models are consistent with our neutron scattering data, but they're not exactly the same as each other. So the important thing is that we have lots of samples of structures that are consistent with our data that aren't exactly the same. Well, what did we expect to see? We were expecting to see that in the intermediate temperature phase, the disordered imidazole ring would start to show some sort of preferred orientations that in neighboring pores, they would all line up in one particular direction and that they would form hydrogen bonds with the framework. We didn't see this. What we saw was the stiffening in the metal cyanide angles of the framework in the intermediate temperature phase. Um, where we see the large spike here, so this is the distribution of the angles for each temperature for our 50 models of 10,000 atoms each, 
And this spike here for the two intermediate temperature phases, yellow and green, shows us that the framework has stiffened. If the disordered gas molecule isn't driving the transition, as we thought it was, perhaps we can substitute it for something else, or we can emit it entirely and see what happens to the dielectric response of just the framework itself. So we use total neutron scattering and reverse Monte Carlo modeling to investigate the dynamics of a MOF, where we thought we'd see two phase transitions. We expected for there to be a correlation between the ordering of the guest molecule with respect to the framework. And we made around 50 unique models of 10,000-ish atoms each at each temperature point and ensured these models were consistent with our scattering data. We analyzed them and we found no appreciable ordering in the guest molecule within the framework. Um, instead, we found that there was an increase in rigidity of the framework. Now, could we have found this out from our Bragg average structure? Absolutely not. We had to do total scattering for this experiment. Would we have found this via x-rays? We certainly would have seen the framework stiffening, but we honestly thought that the hydrogens were much more um, active in the bonding. If we'd used x-rays, we wouldn't have known this. We wouldn't have been able to accurately place the hydrogens within the system. So for this particular question, neutrons were exactly the right tool for the job. Okay, the final example, which is a um, bit quicker, is using single crystal x-ray diffraction. So we're now we're moving over to diamond to model the behavior of a uh, unit cell and atoms inside it as we apply a hydrostatic external pressure. These models work on the average Bragg structure rather than trying to look at the local structure. There's no hydrogens, there's no local order that we're expecting to see. Uh, this is an example that's not exactly from my work, it's from the same group that I was in in Edinburgh. And what they've done is they have squeezed a molecular magnet up to around 4 GPA and then taken uh, the magnetic response of the molecular magnet at those same pressures or at similar pressures. The increase in pressure causes the unit cell to compress and it brings certain magnetic uh, centers closer to each other. And hope is that if you pick a suitable molecular magnet on compression, you can increase the temperature at which you see magnetic ordering or you can enhance the magnetic ordering. So this is what we did. This is an example of the data that we got from Diamond to I-19. Um, again, we're just interested in changes in the unit cell now. Uh, and uh, if you look in the, uh, that you can see in the GIF, so this is the whole pressure series that we've got in that GIF. And we're using much smaller models. So due to the symmetry of this system, I think there's fewer than 10 atoms describing the entire system in this case. On the graph, we can see how the sides of each, un uh, of each cell compress, so how they react to applied pressure. So these are the fractional changes in the A, B, and C axis. So what we can see is that the A axis is the most compressible. Uh, and the rhenium atoms, in, in this case, which are these ones here shown in teal, um, are brought much closer together if they're lying on this plane than the ones that are lying on this plane here. So in order to see what the magnetic response is, we have to do squid magnetometry. Uh, this isn't trivial at high pressures. I, I think it's fairly tricky, uh, even at ambient pressures. To get a feel for the scale here, so this tower is around six foot tall, 1.8 meters tall. And the sample size that we would be looking at would be in the order of a few um, milligrams. We also have to put our sample in some sort of pressure uh, inducing device. So we need to do a lot of background subtraction. And unlike I-19 uh, measurements, where the collection strategy is chosen based on, our, uh, on the limitations of a, uh, of a DAC, here we just have to collect through our pressure transmitting device of a sample in a very small sample in a very large system. Now these experiments as well, uh, we collect down to around 1.8 Kelvin, which means we need helium, so they're not cheap. You really want to do these ones after you've done your um, after you've identified that there is actually a change in the geometry. They, these measurements take around 12 to 16 hours. Um, and it's, sometimes it's not possible to reach the same pressures that we could reach using our diamond anvil cells. But we did manage to get some high pressure data. So this is just an example of uh, some high pressure responses for a molecular magnet. Now this color graph here shows chi-MT increasing with pressure. So we've got low pressure here, high pressure here, 
and we have an increase in chi nt as we increase the pressure applied to the system. If we take this data and we correct for all the background contributions, we can use it to calculate the exchange interactions, and that's what we've got on this graph here. So on the y-axis, we've got the exchange interaction, and here we've got the applied pressure. So we have a structural model that shows us how the inter- and intramolecular geometries oops, sorry, if I can go ahead, um, change with pressure. And now we have the physical response at corresponding pressures. So we can identify which structural changes um, induce the magnetic response. While we were doing our experiments um, at Diamond and prepping for them in our home lab, we noticed that we saw a color change. So we have two samples here, sample one and sample two. They're similar uh, molecular magnets. And at ambient pressure or near ambient pressure, they are fairly pale. So this is the sample here. This is the ruby that we use to check the pressure. And as we increase the pressure to around uh, four, three and a half, four GPA, we have a reversible color change. Now with the first sample, we know that there is a structural phase transition between the two pressures. But for the second sample, there isn't one. So in addition to our X-ray diffraction, uh, diffraction and our magnetometry, we also performed uh, high pressure optical absorption and Raman spectroscopy on our materials. And this was to confirm that this phase transition here was a result of the change in packing geometries that we got from our I-19 data, uh, rather than a change of coordination number, and to compare these two similar molecular magnets. Okay, we're close to wrapping up now. So I-19, both the instrument itself and the support of the instrument scientists, allowed us to collect pressure series on a range of molecular crystals. We had program access, which meant we would go every uh, two or three months, we would have 48 hours on I-19. And despite missing a significant portion of our diffraction data due to shading from the DAC, we're able to make really high quality models of our materials and analyze the changes in inter and intramolecular bonding. The speed that we got our structural results from, this is the important bit here, really allowed us to plan and carry out magnetometry and optical studies on the materials before the end of the grant. We're always working towards a deadline, be at the end of your PhD or running out of funding. And it was because we had this really fast turnaround, something that took 48 hours at Diamond instead of three months at a lab. Um, it allowed us to run these extra calculations and really, really understand what was going on with the material. So yes, at the time of taking these measurements at Diamond, I had access to a lab-based instrument about two to three days a week, which is really very generous. Um, but at that rate, a pressure series would have taken about three months to collect and it would have taken time away from our other group members as well. Instead, because we had program access, all the data I needed was collected in one 48 hour visit. And this was collected in conjunction with about eight other pressure series from colleagues um, at the university. So the output of this is that we're able to predict how we thought changes in geometry affected our magnetic response. We induced those changes. We measured the changes in geometry, we measured the change in the magnetic response, and we confirmed our prediction. Okay, so to summarize everything, this is the last slide here. Access to central facilities, specifically um, ISIS and Diamond, are the foundation on which my PhD and my first postdoc were built. Approximately four weeks of instrument time has given me five years of work, uh, analyzing, writing up, prep, and so on. And what I've done is I've spoken about two very specific cases uh, using ISIS and Diamond for my work. Each site has got a vast range of instruments and theme lines, and each has experts who can guide you to get the absolute most out of them. Odds are, if you have a question, there is a beam line that will help you answer it. And if you, if you speak to your beam line scientists and you couple it with um, supporting experiments, you can really get a lot of interesting results out of your data. So thank you for your time. Sorry I ran over a bit. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them.